This is Talkish. I am Hallie Kesser Jane. Talkish is available at HallieKesserJane.com. This week, a conversation about God. When we explore the age old question, is there a God? Or how about this? Is God a woman? For centuries, these fundamental questions have been integral to every culture and religion the world has known. Joining me today is renowned astrophysicist Dr. Bernard Heisch, the author of Proof of God, and Isabella Price, the author of Goddess Power. It's time for Talkish. Let's get to it. Beginning with my conversation with Bernie Heisch. So, does God exist? And if so, does God care about us? Or is human life a mere accident of physics and biology? Fundamental questions asked that have been studied, argued, and not answered, save by faith. But in the new book, co-authored with New York Times bestselling writer Ptolemy Tompkins, Proof of God, the shocking true answer to the world's most important question, internationally acclaimed astrophysicist Bernard Heisch demonstrates that not only is God real, but that it is science itself that proves it. Bernie Heisch is something of an anomaly, a respected, accomplished scientist who believes firmly and fervently in the existence of God. Of course, many scientists disdain faith, as there is no empirical evidence of God. And many Christians fear science, which they believe contradicts their beliefs. But the truth, Bernie argues in Proof of God, is that you cannot understand the universe without acknowledging that the evidence of God is clear in the very makeup of our world. Science and faith, Bernie Heisch believes, are two sides of the same coin. It's time for Talkish. Let's talk with astrophysicist Bernard Heisch. So Bernie, which came first? Were you a scientist who came to believe in God or were you a believer who became a scientist? How did that work? Well, actually, my interest in becoming a scientist goes way back in my childhood, even preschool era. And I knew I wanted to be an astronomer someday, but I also knew I wanted to be a Catholic priest. And so I followed both these routes, you know, for quite a while, going through a high school. That was a prep school for a seminary, going to a seminary itself for a year. So it, the religion and the science kind of both arose at the same time in my preschool imagination. Aha. Uh-huh. So you were going to be a priest. Why did you not become a priest? Well, when I was 18, I looked around the world and thought, well, there, there are certain things that, you know, strike me as wrong about the, uh, about the Catholic Church. There was the issue of abortion, uh, of a divorce, of, um, let's see, uh, various other things like that, uh, treating uh, divorced people with not very much compassion necessarily back then. Uh, and so it was really these differences with Catholic Church teaching that kind of drove me away from the church. And I really got very interested in science because you know, that had always been a lifelong dream of mine to be a scientist. And so becoming one was a natural thing to do. So you're an astrophysicist. I think you're the first one I've ever spoken with, Ernie. Uh, but let me give you a couple of more uh, kudos here. You're the author of more than 130 uh, scientific publications, the editor of the Astrophysical Journal for 10 years. You've been deputy director of the Center for Extreme Ultraviolet Astrophysics at Berkeley. I, I could go on and on and on. Quite, quite revered in the scientific community, right? So yeah. what is an astrophysicist for those who might not know? So what is involved in being an astrophysicist? Well, you have to study quite a bit of physics and math to even get ready for it. And uh, to have a career in it, you pretty much need to have a PhD. That's sort of the, the basic uh, union card for becoming a, a real scientist. What we get to do are a variety of things. We can either uh, do research or teaching, and most of the astronomers I know do, do research. And they get their uh, funding as a die from NASA often, and uh, they get access to NASA satellites. We were, we were authorized to use various NASA satellites to look at uh, various stars and to get scientific data. That's what I did. So, um, you know, other people specialize in things they can do from the ground, major observatories like those in, uh, in Chile, for example, or on, on the island of uh, Hawaii. So uh, there's a lot of traveling around and making measurements of things in parts of the spectrum you can't see from the ground, or there's teaching if you'd like to do a if you'd like to have a career just um, talking about the wonders of the universe to interested students. So I can see where the two melded together, the astrophysicist and the spiritualist, if you will. How do we get to where science and spiritualism kind of went to war with each other? You know, Judaism, pre-Christianity, embraced science. It still does today. But with Christianity, there seems to be a schism. What's that all about? 
Well, it goes back to the differences between the church, which was a very, a very rigid organization back in the Middle Ages, and uh, the uh, people who decided to, you know, explore nature in an open fashion and became the, you know, the budding scientists of the next few generations. And so there was a lot of persecution of uh, people for not having the proper faith, and the proper faith in the realm of science was often taken to be Aristotle, and Aristotle's teachings are they're interesting philosophically, but they're, they're dead wrong when it comes to certain uh, uh, descriptions of nature. So it goes back to a, a power struggle between uh, the church as the authority for what people would believe, and uh, natural philosophers, as, as they were called back then, being the people that wanted to uh, go ahead and investigate the world in a, a non-secular way, and uh, that became the, the, the scientific uh, side of the, of the equation, and so they naturally kind of were at odds. But it's not necessarily true that they're totally at odds with each other, as is sometimes pictured. In fact, you know, the, the, the Vatican Observatory even runs a, a telescope, a very modern observing facility, on top of Mount Graham in Arizona, right next to the Cape Peak Observatory. So at least in that case of the, of the, of the Catholic Church, they actually have a research uh, telescope, uh, not, one, not just one telescope, but a research uh, site, in Arizona, so it's, it's kind of interesting. So does it get into the politics of it all that gets in the way, at, at, at po- politics and power, uh, that within business, within, within the scientific community, within the uh, religious community, uh, one would say that that's where the schism probably sits. I want to I move on for a second, because I know we're going to get back to that in a minute, but your co-author, uh, Ptolemy Tompkins, by the way, a believer, the former editor of Guidepost magazine, who worked with Eben Alexander, by the way, who has been on the show talking about his many books many times on Proof of Heaven. Uh, Ptolemy is a believer, and you're a scientist, and the two of you get together. I think this is just brilliant. <laughs> I do. I th- this, is, this could be it. This, this is, I wish we could see more of this, and unlikely duo, for sure. But now we have your book. Proof right. of God. Right. I got to tell you, Bernie, that's a hell of a title. <laughs> uh, I, I agree with that, yes. Right? Yeah. So before we get into what your proof is, how did you feel about giving your book the title Proof of God? You gave yourself, I think, a heck of a tall order, and your readers a lot of hopes. Uh, did you have any well, qualms I, about using that title? I tried to use a title that was a, a, a sort of a, a, an attention grabber and was a, was at the same time not beyond what we could deliver. Now, obviously, things that I write, as we've talked about in a few minutes, are not going to um, are not going to convince a, a Dynamo atheist. You know, but these are these are very strong, very strong indicators of God. And to me, when I put it all together, along with everything else I know about you know the subject, I, I, I feel that it's proven to me that this is the the, uh, the correct description of the world at large, and not not a not a uh, um, not the kind of one that you'd expect to come out of a mainstream uh, uh, materialist science. So let's get to it. What is your proof of God? Well, there are, there are four aspects to it. Uh, the proof, of the first proof, is sort of a, 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 a historically it's a good one. Um, it's that the uh, it's the Big Bang actually, and the Big Bang is now taken as one of the premier uh, discoveries, well, not discoveries, but studies of uh, of the early part of the universe by astronomers. But you know, back in the day when this was still being developed, these ideas, back when Einstein was developing his general relativity, the astronomy world still thought that the space was infinite. It was the common belief that space was infinite in size. And, of course, in something like Genesis, you have uh, the universe being created at a point in time through with light. So, in a sense, the the old-fashioned view of the uh, universe being formed by some kind of a a massive creation event is uh, something that was not known by scientists who thought that the universe was infinite. So, in that case, I would score one point for the for the spiritual view over the scientific one, even though now they're both, you know, in agreement that, yes, a Big Bang did occur. Uh, secondly, there's the amazing number of fine-tunings of laws of nature and of um, constants of nature that kind of make the universe a, a conducive place for life. Uh, if we change a few parameters in, in, uh, in, in science, or especially in astrophysics, we would find that um, you wouldn't have the formation of stars and galaxies and planets that we have now. And without stars and, 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 and galaxies and planets, you don't have any life. And so there are an amazing number of these fine structure or fine tunings of nature that, uh, that have been discovered in the last 20 years or so. I have here in my notes, how do you make a universe? Well, it always helps a, a proof if you have a way of demonstrating how you would do something. And I think I have a, an interesting new way of how we would do something in the way of building a universe, and we can talk about that. And so lastly, I think there's a, the actual forensic evidence of, of other worlds that you find in the near-death experience. You mentioned Eben Alexander. And an experience like that, I think, is something that is certainly a strong point of data. It's not just something that should be ignored. So those are my uh, those are my proofs of God, and, um, and I'll stand by it. 
So, so here's something. You do talk about virtual reality versus physical reality. Is that something we should address here? It definitely is because it's a, an important part of the new conceptualization of God that I'm trying to, to make known. To talk. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Throw it into my court. Um, well, let's back up first on, on what I think about God. I think that God is uh, an immortal, transcendent consciousness. God is consciousness, is my belief, and nothing but consciousness. And if you ask me what consciousness is, I just uh, I can say, well, I can't write it out for you. I can't give you an equation for it. But all you have to do is go inside your head, and that's where it is. You know, we are consciousness. So this consciousness, I think, is uh, is God, and this consciousness, I think, wishes to experience what it, what it can do. And so I think, in uh, it decides to break itself into millions and millions and billions of pieces and go live in in, in, in universes that it has created uh, in order to experience the various possibilities of, of life. So, from that point of view, uh, you can then ask yourself, well, what about the creation of the universe? How do you explain that? Uh, I don't think you actually need any, any universe, it's a physical universe at all. In fact, we are, are um, developing the kinds of games that are really very realistic these days, and, and the, uh, the kids are wild over them, you know, the uh, Dungeons and Dragons sorts of things. The, the virtual world that you can create nowadays is really quite impressive. And I, I can imagine what kind of a virtual world could, could be created by a god who has you know, billions of years of more experience than we have in doing such a thing. So rather than have to sort of make a universe out of nothing, which I suppose God could do, but I kind of suspect he doesn't, I think that you have instead a virtual universe, I think we have real beings, real, uh, real you and me, who are souls, who are immortal souls, immortal spirits, who were sort of sent off by God to go into this material realm. But what we experience here is not reality. It is a very, very... Uh, clever and very sophisticated virtual reality. And that, in fact, agrees with some of the ancient ideas about the world. For example, the, the concept of Maya, the world being an illusion, as you'd find in Hinduism. So the whole point of this is that I think you, you don't need to explain how a universe can come about, but you can point to God as being the, the author of it, as if it were kind of a virtual reality game, but not with any kind of electronics. Certainly you don't have any electronics to make virtual worlds, but you don't need that. You have God's thoughts. What a, what a universe, what a, what a computer can, can synthesize God can do with his, with his own thoughts, I think. So let me, let me, let me stop you for a second because there are a couple of things that pop into my head. One is, if this is what you're saying is true, then we're all God in, in one step way or another. Right. Then consciousness is thought, correct? Yes. So yes, if you have bad thought, what's that about? Well, the idea that we are God, yeah, it's true. Of course, you don't remember that we're God. And then keep in mind that this, from this point of view, consciousness is everything. And so there's nothing else but consciousness. And there would also then be nothing else but God. So God, how is God going to make us? Well, he would kind of make us by having some of his own stuff become the millions and billions and trillions of living things that inhabit that universe that he also creates. We create, co-created together probably with God. And so this is a, a kind of virtual world that I think makes, makes sense, that um, you don't have to come up with some kind of explanation for how a real universe would be made. You come up with one that uh, says, how, how would God do it? And to make a virtual reality that's uh, of the, uh, you know, the same kind of form as we have here with games, you simply use God, God would simply use his thoughts to make it happen. You sort of, you sort of running, on, running, put it this way, running a computer script and getting something to happen, or having God think about it, you know, think about steps one, two, three, four, et cetera, et cetera, would be the same thing. And so I think that this consciousness of God extended to us shows how we relate, relate to him and why we are here. We are here to, to uh, live in virtual worlds that give us the opportunity to learn. Okay, so there's empirical evidence, right? Right, from your death experience. So where are you on faith? Is faith a must in the component of religion, of relationship to God, faith versus proof? I mean, where do you, what do you say to that? I mean, we often talk in terms of leap of faith when it comes to all of this. Is, is faith no longer necessary? Or after all, as your title suggests, there is proof of God, therefore we don't need faith. Not that there's anything wrong with faith, but play with I feel, that. I feel, very, I feel very ambivalent about faith. On the one hand, um, it, even, it says in, in various places in the New Testament that you need faith to, to um, understand uh, the, the spiritual world. But on, as a scientist, I have to say, well, this is something we shouldn't try to encourage. Faith means believing something regardless of the evidence. But I'm kind of torn by that because I think that what we're talking about here is beyond the physics and science as we know it. And I think, I think in, therein I've got the, the feeling that it's okay to have faith. And, of course, most people would probably need faith to, to keep themselves sustained in a, in a spiritual way. So I feel ambivalent about it, but, I, but I, I guess I myself have a certain amount of faith. 
at least at the 99% level, not the, one, not the, not the 100% level. It, there's a duality, and maybe we don't have to say it's one way or the other, uh, and, and, and because it's all things, probably. I, I do want to hit on one thing. Which came first, the chicken or the egg? The bang, Big Bang God? I, that, that's something also that I think people get lost on. And, and I just real quickly want to hear what you have to say about that. Well, it is a huge mystery because uh, the Big Bang, I mean, we know the Big Bang happened. You know, we can actually see it now. The Nobel Prize has been given to uh, the, one of the scientists that ran a mission to see it. So we know that the, that the uh, Big Bang happened because the remnants of its radiation are still evident in the, in the sky. In fact, interestingly enough, they were measured. The, the detection of the, of the remnant uh, radiation from the Big Bang was detected by a couple of guys who were working for the telephone company 40 years ago trying to eliminate noise from the telephone system. And uh, they discovered, well, they couldn't eliminate all the noise because, as it turns out, the, the basic noise that they found was the remnants of the background radiation of the zero-point field of uh, the uh, Big Bang. So um, let's see. Now, I kind of wandered around a bit. Well, what, we were what, talking about what, which came first, uh, the, the chicken or the egg, God, or, or the Big Bang. or um, so. Um, and I don't know that there's an answer to that. I'm just, I thought I'd throw it out there because I think there always is that, that, you know, that beginning, that moment, that first the Bible starts, right, if you talk about it um, in religious terms um, right. in the beginning. Let me take you someplace. <laughs> I'm really curious to see where you go with this, okay? Okay. Science is proof. Faith is religion or spirituality. Faith as emotion. Can religion function without faith? Can a scientist to afford, see how my head works, to have emotion in the conversation of proof of God. I mean, is God about science of the mind? Because now you're talking about conscience, consciousness or a necessity of the heart. And mm. God, emotion, mind, spirit, what... I'm talking to a scientist now who just feels that he's proven the existence of God, and I just wonder whether there's an emotional component to it. Well, um, I think that I have a certain amount of faith. Uh, probably not as deep a faith as, as perhaps one could, could have. So you think faith is emotion? Um, faith, I wouldn't say is emotion. I say that it has a component. Okay. There's something of it that, that furthers uh, that. So, so emotion is a part of this equation. I guess it is. I, I would prefer to keep it out because, as a scientist, uh, you know, I don't like to have things intruding on my my work that are probably extraneous, or at least, I may even be. Um, well, because you know why I go there? Because the the, old, the the God is love. And if God right. is love. God, is, that's an emotion. It is. I've actually heard it described, though, as the love is not just a vague, wishy-washy, kind of new-agey term. And God viewed at this kind of level is actually a force. Now, now this is, that, tant- that really tantalizes me because forces are things that I've studied a lot about. Uh, but I, I don't know how seriously to take that comment. But it's, 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 it's possible that love becomes more than just a metaphor or something like that or a, a buzzword. It actually acquires some strength in the context of meta- metaphysical creation. So you know, that's pretty far out there to even talk about that. No, I don't think it is. I actually, th- I, I, I actually agree with you. I, I think that I think we can create love. We don't have to wait for love. Yeah, yeah. Right? Right, right. So, yeah, and maybe that's going out a little far, and my head can do that sometimes. And <laughs> so I figured, it's, so can yours, so let's, let's play that. Listen, most of us define God by giving God a human component, generally a male figure, perhaps mm-hmm. to help us with our faith. Your thoughts on that? Is attachment to a picture important. I, well, what is your perception of God? I'm very curious. But what is your concept of God within that? Is it stagnant? Is it ever, uh, ever evolving? I just, a supreme intelligence? I threw a lot at you. Maybe you'll first want to start with what you, your perception. Right. Well, and this goes back a long way for me. I had the um, experience back when I was uh, doing postdoctoral work at the University of Colorado. It occurred to me that being a scientist, as, as I was by then, uh, at least I had the PhD then, and also coming from a background that had quite a bit of religion behind it, that perhaps I could be the one that could, or a one, some to be egotistical about it, a one, to uh, to bring some things together that are just not have not been where the dots have not yet been connected. So I, I thought about that quite a bit when I was in my late twenties, but then I sort of forgot about it as I got remarried and, and had kids and went off to Europe to work in astrophysics. Kind of forgot about that. Kind of kept it in the background. And then surprisingly enough, getting involved in the religious things or spiritual matters again began to occur to me about maybe 10 years or so ago. And so as if, as if the, the thought I had when I was in my late 20s, that someday I might be able to do something that's you know, a novel way to connect the dots in the religion side of things with, together with science, 
uh, is actually coming true. I started writing a book about that called The God Theory, and that was followed then by another book called The Purpose Guided Universe, and then the one that you had mentioned, The uh, the uh, Proof of God, and I'm writing a fourth one now, too. So I'm kind of, now that I'm retired from active research, I can uh, do these things that I thought, that interesting that I thought I would do when I was much younger, but never got around to it, and now it's finally happening. So all of this is evolutionary. I guess so, yes. Yeah. So is, is, is there more that you want to tell us before I go on to my next question in terms of the evolution? Is there more to the theory than we've, uh, um, something new? Are you alluding to the biological theory of evolution? Mm-hmm. I think it's fine. I think that, that I think it's, it's terrific. You, I think one of the reasons that maybe even the, the prime reason that God does this um, living in the worlds he can create is to see what can arise, what can happen. What, what might naturally come about applying his, his own laws to this world at large that he's made and uh, with us in it, you know, surviving and, and, and living in that world. Um, and I have, I have absolutely no problem with the, with the Darwinian evolution. I think it's great. In fact, I think it's absolutely, let me say this publicly, publicly it's absolutely essential from my point of view that the, the theory of evolution be accepted as being a way the species evolve. And I think that's the, the physical part of the plan that God has to let things and he, given his um, given his input to let things develop and grow on their own, because if he were doing this in some intrusive kind of way, which I think you have an in intelligent design, you you wouldn't really accomplish the purpose, which which is to I, I think for God to explore Himself, for God to explore Himself in a way that we do we explore our own lives and and you know learn learn from them or either oh, I suppose learn from them whether it's good or bad, and I think that that's the way that the information about you know what's good and what is bad and. And what is great about his power gets sent back to God through our, through our actions, the, the actions of our lives as sort of the emissaries of God who live in his world, which we probably co-created with him. Co-created with him. Probably co-created with him, because after all, I mean, we are little sparks of God, I think, so why shouldn't we have a hand in this? Now, the one thing that seems mysterious sometimes is to think, well, um, okay, if that's the case, then uh, why don't I remember this? Why don't I remember that I was an emanation from God? And the argument there is really pretty simple. You can't play the game, the game of life, if you know if you know all the rules and, and you know what what's going to happen. So this playing of the game of life that we do necessarily um, is dependent upon our not knowing what we've done in previous lives. Because if we knew all that, that would certainly have an impact on our present life, and maybe even as humblest keep us from ever get, getting out of a whatever bad karma we've gotten ourselves into, or uh, in some other way just interfere. You can't have the, the interference of past knowledge obstructing the choices that you can have. If you enter life fresh and new, and you know you're you're doing it really in a, in a new sense. So reincarnation is really evolution. It's it's the way which evolution. It's one aspect of how evolution works. Yes, I would right. say that's true. Okay, that's interesting. So listen, while you're working on improving the existence of God, your fellow scientists appear to have been and continued to be in the business of disproving God. How do you, the scientist, and you, the believer, reconcile their proof against the existence of God with your proof of God? That that fascinates me. You just think you're right, right? I do think I'm right. <laughs> which is fine, which is perfectly fine. But right based on, on, on the fact that you're a scientist and, and, and it's empirical, not, not just gut. Well, I think that one of the biggest problems that scientists have and don't realize themselves is that they, uh, they don't really understand how their own views uh, can be as uh, slewed, uh, bigoted one way or the other as something religious can. It's just that when you learn all the rules of science, you practice the profession, and you, you talk to people in, that, in the field, your colleagues, um, you find that those that are that have no uh, religious belief, no belief in God, they, they, they may not have any kind of a, an understanding of it because they've never studied it. You're so busy as a scientist that you don't have time to go out and, and learn and steep yourself in, in the spiritual traditions. And there's so much that you could learn. You could have to learn. You could have a whole career on that side of the, life, of the fence if you wanted to do that for your life's work. So it's, it's kind of ignorance. It's ignorance of the evidence. Gosh, there are, there are scientists who deny the near-death experiences, and we've had thousands of them, with people reporting things they just couldn't, uh, ex- you couldn't explain any other way. So I think it's a matter of ignorance, and a matter of, I'll say ignorance and arrogance, but I don't want to say it too strongly because you know, I don't want to demean my, my profession. I'm a, you know, an astronomer who's had a very good career in, in, in astrophysics. You know, I've been well-funded and had access to NASA experiment, NASA research satellites and all of that, and I'm grateful for it. But I also think that perhaps in, in many ways I've thought more clearly, or at least longer, let's say longer rather clearly, longer about some of these issues on, this, on the uh, spiritual side than many of my colleagues who are so busy that they've, you know, 
Maybe they published a few more papers than I've had with the time they've got to spare. I have uh, a few more questions, and we're running out of time, so um, I'm, I'm watching that clock. From a scientist's point of view, is, is prayer hocus-pocus, or does it have a scientific component to it? Is there proof that prayer works? Well, I don't know about proof, but I think it does work, and it probably does, because one of the things that God is, if nothing else, is creative. I mean, this, this, this uh, great uh, consciousness is certainly creative. Well, if we are sparks of him, then what are we? Well, we've got to be creative, too. I mean, we've got, we've got that... You know, as our birthright. And so being creative, I think, means that we have a hand in co-creating this universe together with other people. That, um, you know, what we, what we perceive as reality is probably what we have cooked up together with together with God and perhaps with other entities that, you know, reside in the same sphere. You know, plants and animals, for example, reside on the earth, and so they probably have a say in this. They're probably not a big one. I'm thinking of my turtle. I probably would have very little say about that. So, um yeah, I think evolution is really the, the essential thing. And uh, so I'm not an evolutionary. I'm, I'm, I'm pro-evolutionary. Well, we're talking about prayer at the moment, and I want to talk to you about it, and, and I want to say this to you, because we've been talking about science and spirituality. Can God be felt, seen, appear? Can God part the seas, Mr. Scientist, Mr. Believer? Is there such a thing as miracles? And if so, what accounts for miracles? I mean, is, if there's proof of God, is there proof of miracles? Or is, hey, buddy, is that a new book? <laughs> I'm giving you an idea for a book. <laughs> I, think Ptolemy, I think Ptolemy has such a book underway. I'm looking around on my shelf here. Is that I'm true? Sure that's under, underway. <laughs> oh, well, there you go. Okay, I love that. I mean, that's important. But where are you on, on the concept of, of, of miracles? I mean, I want to say one thing. I want to interject before you answer me. You have a, uh, I, I think, almost, uh, you have a delicious concept of God. I mean, you, when I hear you talk, I see some guys, you know, playing with a, with his play thing, whatever that thing is where, you know, you, I don't do it. I'm not that young, you know, where the kids play with their, their machine and, and with this virtual world, you know. I, God ha- likes games and toys and maybe more fun than, <laughs> yeah, no, no. than God gets credit for being. Now, you know, this is getting to be a real topic in science. Do, can we create an artificial intelligence or can we even download our intelligence onto some software, onto some, onto some hard disk and apply the right software and then we get, you know, a, a, a human version of me that's nothing but electronics. This is awful. To me, this, this way of thinking is about the most horrible conception of, of creating an afterlife for yourself that I can think of. You know, people want to come to the point where they can download themselves onto something or other and thereby it would be immortal. That's awful. That's just terrible. On the other hand, if you change the picture a little bit, you say, well, okay, uh, the idea that you can have some kind of a, a world created that there's an entity, a spiritual being, a soul can enter into, and you have that... Uh, you have that, and the driver behind that is a, some super com- com- computation that God carries out. And, of course, God does not have to plug his computer into an outlet. All God has to do is think. I mean, God can actually think through all of the, 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 uh, the steps in a given equation, a given uh, hardware code. Could, we're going to run through all of those. And if you wanted to have that appear to himself, I suppose, as a, as, as a, you know, a well-formatted, uh, well-rendering uh, kind of thing. So I think that we could substitute God's thoughts as a powering device for the uh, electronics we use to generate such a thing here on, the, on Earth. And uh, it's, a pretty good, it's a pretty good analogy. Well, on the other hand, the miracles could be God playing with his PlayStation. I think that God probably, I think he reserves himself the right to do something like that. But he probably tries to stay away from it because it would, it would be contrary to his own plan to um, do things that are miracles because he's supposed to not do miracles to see what happens. You see, so his playing miracles is allowed for him. I mean, after all, he's God, or would be God. But it's probably not a good idea to do that because then it kind of uh, it messes up the experiment or the game, whichever way you want to look at it. I pray he's not a game player. How do, how do you like that word, <laughs> that sentence? Okay, Bernie, I think we've proven that you're a serious scientist. I mean, you've entered the world of popular science, which I think is a good thing. A brain like yours needs to be uh, made available to uh, us, you know, kind of like uh, not as smart as you are kind of people. Uh, a scientist who's also a believer, a believer with a message to get out to the world. So the bottom line for you, Mr. De Bernard Heisch, right. I love that name, Heisch. Bottom line, sum it up. What's the bottom line in your message? I'm going to sure you out and buy my book, which is... <laughs> <laughs> so like, I'll make sure I sell that for you, for sure. But go on. <laughs> well, yeah. if you read my books, you'll see that there's a lot to be said for belief in God, but you have to probably change your perspective of God somewhat to make it, have it make sense. If you want to believe in a God that's up there someplace in the clouds, that obviously is absurd because we've been to the clouds and, and yeah, there's nothing there. Besides, if there were, it would be absurd still because... 
you know, how do you explain who made the clouds or whatever you want to call the, you know, the, the environment up there? So I think you have to come up with a conception of God that makes sense scientifically. It doesn't violate any scientific uh, knowledge. And then you can do that. And, I, and that's what I tried to show in the book, that, that you, you can do this sort of um, side-by-side uh, companionship between science and spirit, between science and uh, spirituality. And, um, yeah, read the book. Uh, one last question. What would the world be without God? Well, uh, I think, first of all, you wouldn't be able to have a world without God, because in my view here, God is the, the creator of it. If the creator's gone, well, there's not, ain't nothing going to happen. You can't make nothing out of nothing. So that's the, the first level answer. If you're talking about somehow having a world here that's like the one we have, except somehow God's not there, I can't even envision that. I mean, it would probably open the door to all sorts of evil, because human beings have a nature that is uh, that's bifurcated, I guess. We have a certain amount of good and bad in us. And unfortunately, sometimes evil takes control. But beyond that, I don't know what else I would say about a missing, about a God, universe with a missing God. I've been speaking with Dr. Bernard Heisch. His book, Proof of God, available on Amazon.com and at fine bookstores everywhere. You are listening to Talkish with Hallie Kesser Jane, The Hallie Kesser Jane Show. My guests today are Dr. Bernard Heisch, along with Ptolemy Tompkins, the author of Proof of God, and Isabella Price, the author of Goddess Power. Talkish with Hallie Caster Jane. Post new podcasts Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern at HallieCasterJane.com. So, what if this afternoon we learned definitively that God is a woman? Why do most of us conceive of God as a man? God the Father of God ruling with testosterone. Suppose, just suppose, God is a woman and all that implies the feminine of love and healing, birth and death, renewal and evolutionary change. Would there be a complete paradigm shift? In Goddess Power, Awakening the Wisdom of the Divine Feminine in Your Life, author Isabella Price takes readers on an empowering journey into the heart of the goddess traditions, inviting us to learn the rich history and wisdom teachings of the divine feminine goddess in her numerous manifestations. Price explores goddess symbols, stories, and key themes, as well as offers valuable spiritual insights on the role the goddess plays in people's lives today. God of goddess, masculine of feminine, yin and yang, integration. At the root of our cultural challenges, posits Price, lies the imbalance between the masculine and the feminine that most of our political, economic, and religious institutions have, for a very long time, been shaped by the unhealthy masculine or patriarchal values of conquest, domination, control, competition, authoritarian power structures, dualistic thinking, or separation between us and them, me and the other, winners and losers, unconscious assumptions and beliefs that have shaped the way we think, speak, and act. It's time to embrace the feminine, rebalance the universe. It's time for Talkish. Let's talk with Isabella Price. So, Isabella Price, so nice to have you here. Before we begin, I want to speak to you about the word goddess. That word, I think many men and a few women find a little bit scary, off-putting, out there, too much of responsibility, maybe too new age, too mythological. Let's talk about the word goddess, first goddess versus woman or or the feminine, and and, and put this in some uh, historical uh, terms for us, the archetype of the goddess. Yes, uh, great question. Thank you. Um, Well... Uh, what you said, you know, just to pick that up, it's true that it's interestingly enough still a bit. Um, people feel some people feel uncomfortable when talking about the goddess, and that of course has to do with the social cultural conditioning for many centuries. And also, of course, when we look at organized religion, um, especially you know the um, Abrahamic uh, religions, uh, the word goddess has been demonized. I mean, we see that that in scripture, you know, the prophets, you know, in the Torah would always 
a leash out against goddess worship and you know god forbid that the hebrew man would go into the temples and worship the canaanite fertility goddesses so i mean that has been passed down to us through the judeo-christian traditions at least organized religion and but when we look at, at the history and to give you some um, context here then we can definitely say that goddess worship is much more ancient and dates back to the so-called Paleolithic period, which is the Old Stone period, going back 20,000 years ago, when um, we see the representation of goddess figurines at entrances of cave shelters where our ancestors likely gathered for ritual, and um, some of these goddesses are represented with, um, you know, broad hips and large breasts, because at that time we have to remember that the survival of humanity was always at stake. And so, of course, our ancestors marveled at, um, you know, the, the life-giving powers of the goddess and and were in awe and wonderment at the miracle of, of birth. And so it's not that surprising that uh, a, a feminine figurine, you know, became the, the focal point of worship at that time. And then later on, you know, when, when after the invention of the script with the emergence of the great civilizations, for example, Egypt or Babylonia, we clearly have the great mother goddess in all of these cultures who has a very prominent status in worship and um, is, is actually honored as the bringer of civilizations, the art of civilizations like, you know, pottery, weaving, um, agricultural skills, and she's praised in those inscriptions as Queen of Heaven, which um, interestingly enough is a title that Mother Mary officially is affiliated with after the Assumption became official doctrine in the 1950s. Other titles are Sustainer of Life and even the Savior of the human race, which, as we know, is a title that Jesus Christ later on co-opted. Yeah, but it ain't um, over till it's over. Let me interject. <laughs> of course, we st- we yeah. still have our chance to get there and fix what's wrong, which we're going right. to pursue in a minute. Do you feel that it, in what your answer to my question that you've de- uh, defined the divine feminine, the divine goddess uh, and her traits, or do you think we've got that um, for the purposes of where we're going to go forward? Yes, perhaps one more thing, um, you know, is that... The divine feminine at its source, I believe, is one, but of course the goddess appears in multiple manifestations across cultures and religions, so she has innumerable names, and she also has, you know, somewhat mysterious and almost paradoxical manifestations, because sometimes she appears as the benevolent nurturing mothers, but then sometimes also as a fierce and terrifying mother, usually affiliated with the mysteries of death. And so with all of these different symbols and attributes, we still need to be aware of, I believe, that the enduring essence of of the divine feminine, the goddess, is ultimately one and always the same. It just manifests in that broad array of representations. So um, I would say this is an important thing to understand as we move forward with, um, you know, diving deeper into you know the goddess and her mysteries yes now i want to address this i want to address the masculine Mm -hmm. not as a polarity because i know you 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 would take uh, issue with that but let's talk about goddess to would be god and the masculine because god takes on a very different connotation than goddess but let's put the masculine part of this on the table yes well, here's the thing. Again, it is a bit unfortunate that, you know, the, the masculine face of God, again, in organized religion has come down to us rather as a stern and punishing and often very unforgiving father. I mean, if you look, for example, at the notion of God that fundamentalists in different religions carry, so they, they, they don't necessarily see uh, God as a God of love and, and abundance. 
And so, 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 so we have that image. It's, it's somewhat entrenched in our collective unconscious, uh, perhaps we could say, at least, you know, in the Judeo-Christian traditions. And, and that, of course, is, is not necessarily what I believe what God is all about. I certainly believe in a God of love and abundance. But due to that patriarchal conditioning, many people carry that image, not only of God as a father, this archetypal sky father that is way up in the heavens above us and even against us if we don't abide by his laws, you know, and follow, um, you know, scripture. And that, <laughs> to me, quite frankly, is, is a somewhat very immature conception of the divine because it divides us, it keeps us separate from the divine if we envision the divine as this archetypal sky father high up in the heavens who is not really connected and separated from his creation which includes all of us and that to me is, is very problematic and when you look at mainstream religions it's astounding that now you know in early 2018 you know 21st century we still find these notions entrenched you know in, in people's heads you know and, and it's again part of the, the collective unconscious it's the, the archetype of the father that has been so overvalued for centuries Okay, at the so let expense me answer, of the right. mother. Okay, yep. at the expense of the mother. That was the important sentence there. It seems to me that many of our problems today, our differences, are exacerbated, or exacerbated, I should say, when we bring the word or the concept of religion into the conversation. So I'd like to stop for a moment here, okay, mm -hmm. and, and discuss spirituality, not versus religion, maybe something new and uh, maybe an evolution of religion. Because as off-putting as the term goddess might be to some, I think religion is to others. And, and I think spirituality to some people also antagonizes them. It might be uh, good for us to understand these things are constantly in motion, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. I mean, evolution is at play constantly in everything. Usually we talk about biological evolution, but of course there is cultural evolution and, you know, we are constantly evolving individually and also collectively as a, as a culture. And, you know, to pick up your question, um, the term spirituality, it's true that some people seem to have that idea that, well, spirituality is all woo-woo stuff, you know, uh, it's that esoteric stuff, you know, kind of up in the clouds and, you know, they're not comfortable with the word spirituality or even mystical or mysticism and nothing could be further from the truth. I do believe that first off spirituality gives you a direct connection to spirit in whatever form spirit is important to you because we all have our unique journeys and so uh, Again, to come back, um, spirituality connects us directly. It, it actually roots us. It connects us not just to our true self, our true nature, who we truly are, but to everybody else around and to nature and, you know, all the magnificent beings with whom we, we share this planet. So it actually connects us. I think this is really a key word that people need to understand. So it's not something up in the cloud that's, you know, woo-woo uh, stuff. And of course, even organized religion can hold space for some spiritual expressions. I mean, the, the two as you also said, don't necessarily need to be antagonistic to each other. If the religion allows for a viable spirituality to flourish, of course, and that, that varies, again, de depending on the institution. But, I mean, there are forms of spirituality in all organized religions. And important is really also the evolutionary aspect, as you pointed out rightly, that we have to see that nothing is static. As, as I said at the beginning, and we need to update some of these outdated or anachronistic belief systems that are, you know, very dogmatic. And when we think the religions were all, they all emerged, you know, during the traditional period of consciousness and culture. So we're talking about 3,000 years ago, roughly. And some of these doctrinal beliefs have not really been 
updated to meet modern or postmodern sensibilities. So these outdated beliefs cannot address our soul needs. They cannot meet us where we are today. So these beliefs have to be updated to, to nourish us on a deeper soul level. Or they just become obsolete. Okay. So at some point, okay, and I'm not sure whether it matters exactly when, the masculine gained control. The mm-hmm. yin and the yang got thrown off. There was no balance. And and if you don't want to think of it in terms of gaining control, which may have been what happened, perhaps we should address the term, this imbalance. I've said it a couple of times. Uh, the wisdom of the goddess divine feminine has been ignored, distorted, and oppressed for centuries, but it could be because of this imbalance. And what we're really talking about here and all of it, what you've written about in this terrific book is getting the balance back, I think. Am I correct? Totally. Yes. That is key, and I'm, I'm so glad you're actually bringing that up because, yeah, so, so it's true that, you know, the, the, the feminine here is, or the yin, is really the missing piece. And I do believe, and I'm saying this uh, may sound radical to some people, but I like radical because it means going to the root of things. I do believe that unless we find, again, a healthy balance of both the archetypal masculine and the archetypal feminine, I do believe that uh, we have no future. In other words, you know, without addressing and integrating this missing piece, both psychologically and energetically, I do not think we are able to take the next evolutionary leap and and birth, you know, that that vision that we all carry deeply in our hearts and that we know is is possible, uh, you know, on on this planet. And it, it, this imbalance, of course, has manifested in obvious ways. I mean, just look at the current dysfunction, you know, on the political and economic level. Uh, I mean, it's all over the world, not just here in the U.S., even though here it might be more obvious because this country wields so much power and influence in the world at large. Uh, but I, I do, and I'm, I'm really very adamant about that, that I, I do believe this is truly key. So what we need is like you know, a sacred union, or perhaps we could call it a sacred marriage of both the qualities of the archetypal masculine and the archetypal feminine. And when we talk about these terms, masculine and feminine, it's also very important to dissociate these words from gender. So it has nothing to do with with the biology, because both men and women have the whole range of archetypal qualities and energy available at their disposal. So both genders have all these potentialities available. So it's really about the sacred marriage within us, within our psyche of both the quality of the masculine and the feminine, which tends to be a more holistic and nurturing paradigm versus, you know, all the separation, domination and exploitation paradigm that is an expression of the, the unhealthy masculine or, or the hyper-masculine, as, as I also call it. Yeah, and I think that's brilliant. And I, and, and I really, you, you went right where I was going next. And I think that's, that's essential to this entire conversation. And it's more universal. Besides the fact that we have to stop thinking of ourselves only in terms of gender, there, there is this spirit. Spirit, and the spirit is nurtured by by both the masculine and the feminine. We're we're way off kilter, uh, yeah. in my opinion, way way off kilter. And I I want to get back to uh, God as a woman. <laughs> I love the concept <laughs> of God being a woman in, in different cultures and in different religious traditions. God as both mother and father could be a possibility. Not talked about a lot. That fascinates yeah. me. Yes, yes, absolutely. See, that's really beautiful that you're bringing that up because there is a word in Aramaic which, as we know, was the language of Jesus Christ, Abun Bajmaya, which actually is the word for God. And what it really means, translated in English, is God as a parent. So that means God as both you know, father and mother. So that was the understanding they had at that time. And unfortunately, the mother eventually got lost in translation or, you know, perhaps she was deliberately omitted when, you know, the religious systems became increasingly managed by men, which which happened primarily in the second century CE and then, of course, the following um, centuries with the consolidation of, of the church, you know, and the church became an imperial Roman church and adopted, you know, Roman patriarchal values. But 
this is really a beautiful image of God as both, you know, father and mother. And there are uh, metaphors in scriptures that depict God in a more nurturing, feminine quality as, you know, the, the womb, the womb of love that holds us tenderly, you know, and, and th that's that's really the, the image that's affiliated at least with one aspect of, of you know, God as, as mother. Um, so so that's, that's something that people need to, you know, be reminded of that God wasn't necessarily always a father exclusively and then of course God transcends all notions of gender anyway God is both form and formless uh, immanent and transcendent so it, it's an energy that goes way beyond these gender conceptions that our limited human minds can conceive of I mean that's something we need to be aware of in general when talking about the divine and, absolutely uh, yeah and, and there's <clears throat> something else here too which we get into and that is the fact that I think that everything is opposites today there are there is no middle ground I mean, that's yeah. gone from, from every form of dialogue, relationship, everything. It's win-lose. Mm -hmm. People are missing the, the middle. So I, I want I want to think about that. And, and, and of course, I have to go to politics. <laughs> Isabella knows me, knows I can't keep my mouth shut on that <laughs> score. <laughs> so here I go. But I want to do this fairly. Many would disagree that the world is an abject chaos. I think you and I share that we're at a real tipping point here uh, and something has to give. But in politics, my opinion has become the new religion. And I, I actually get the feeling that some worship their party more than God or their goddess. Mm -hmm. And in this age of Trump, this is what I see. I sort of see, and, and maybe this is just purely literal. This may be uh, creative fantastical, maybe there's a better word, that Trump is sort of the last gasp of the testosterone god. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> they say it's always darkest before the dawn, Isabella. <laughs> yeah. So here's my question, though, to keep it where we're at. How does the goddess help us here? Excellent question. And I wholeheartedly agree with you. We see the last desperate ditch effort of the patriarchy, you know, in its most pathological form to just dig in and, and you know, hold back evolution, hold on to their power. So uh, sometimes things need to get worse before they get better. That's totally how I see it. And also, of course, from a broader evolutionary perspective. But let me elaborate on this um, a little further. I do believe that right now, we're really going through what, you know, the mystics call a dark night journey of the soul, um, not just individually, but collectively. That means that a lot of what has been repressed in our culture comes to the surface. And in fact, it has to come to the surface so that we can face it. It's like, you know, a cosmic mirror that's being held in front of your face and you cannot ignore it any longer. And this applies to our individual psychological shadow issues, to use the Jungian term, which are issues we have not yet healed and processed. So it has to come up so that we hopefully can work through those issues and release those issues and then we can evolve psycho-spiritually. So in other words, we have to do the inner work and that's anything but easy. We all know that it's hard to face your shadow issues. It's much easier to just bypass them and as you know, spiritual bypassing is a huge issue in the spiritual marketplace but there is no way we can avoid that and now collectively of course each nation has also its unresolved wounds and shadow issues and if we take the US right now it's quite obvious you know with, with racism which has come to the forefront sexual abuses and misogyny as we can see now with, with the courageous women stepping up and, and really speaking their truth and sharing their experiences in the media to movement, homophobia, you know, against lesbians and homosexuals, people with different sexual orientation, Islamophobia, you know, the whole war against people, you know, who are Muslims. I mean, it, the list just goes on and on. And also I want to mention also the shadow issues related to Native Americans, which this country has never properly processed. I mean, it, it, it just is a fact. And, you know, as somebody who grew up in Europe and studied history, it was always clear to me that this is something, a wound that, that still begs for healing. And so right now we see in our current government 
that, you know, the, the person who's sitting in the White House or, you know, the occupier of the White House, whatever you want to call it, embodies a lot of these shadow issues. So he really brings it to the surface. And I feel that this is evolution at work or spirit at work. And it, particularly the dark skinned mother goddess, I believe, is at work here. And I can't help, I always get this metaphor, this image of Kalima, you know, the tantric dark skinned goddess of the Shakta tradition in India, who is the fierce and terrifying mother who holds the sword and cuts through all the illusions with one shocking blow. And I do believe that she's at work right now in all the chaos, in all this upheaval, because dark-skinned goddesses do also embody the shadow, that which we have repressed in our culture for so long and which now is coming to the forefront so that we may address these issues and work through these issues and hopefully heal ourselves from these issues so that we can take the, the the next evolutionary leap as, as a culture and society. Yeah, I, I think it's it's absolutely brilliant the way that you put it, and I think it makes it understandable to people who I think right now are grasping to have some understanding of what is going on here. There is not a day that goes by in my life, 15 times a day, that I don't get an email or a Facebook post or a Twitter, something <laughs> from somebody who says to me, can we withstand this? Three more <laughs> years of this? And I, you know, I, and I just say, you know, this is, this is all very Jungian, ex- incredibly so. And, mm-hmm. and it's on a personal psyche uh, issue, to, you know, and, and it's on the, the personal unconscious and, and the collective unconscious. And, and I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're on an interesting journey, <laughs> needless <laughs> to say. I have two quick questions. One is this. Do we need to throw caution to the wind in any of this? Are there any pitfalls related to the divine feminism? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the pitfall is, as I mentioned before, is if we tied in with gender, first off, because again, both men and women have the energies of the divine feminine in them. It expresses itself through their creative potential, for example, you know, whatever you bring into the world. So this is Shakti, the cosmic life force of the mother that comes to you if you're creative. And that's the whole range, you know. That's what the, the other thing, let's not get stuck on pre-modern forms of the mother, like, you know, mythological forms. And yes, the mother, of course, has always been depicted as form so that people can uh, devotionally relate to her easier that way. But the mother also transcends form. And when we look at her from a more evolutionary perspective, we need to move beyond the image. So, you know, a kind of more, a more or, um, you know, also transpersonal component because, you know, we're, we're living in, in postmodern times and, and we've had the scientific revolution in between. So it's very important to take this into consideration. And uh, to just conclude here, perhaps with one little sentence, I really see women, Western women, playing an, a, a key role right now in this evolutionary leap that we need to take as humanity um, unless we we just destroy ourselves and that is I see us as co-creators, the feminine co-creator, it's a term I adopt from Barbara Marks Hubbard um, you know, a great evolutionary visionary and I believe that uh, we women really need to to marry, you know, as I said, the energies of the masculine and feminine within us so that we don't just co-opt, you know, these hyper-masculine patterns to succeed, but really also remember that that uh, we also have that nurturing side, nurturing towards ourselves and, and everybody else around us, and that we marry those two and really step it up as, as the conscious uh, feminine co-creator, you know, who will help and play a key role in birth, this, this new vision, um, this, this, this new world, which, again, is, is absolutely uh, key. Um, and, and so, yes, so this is what I can say. So let's not get caught up with this potential pitfall. So I hope that... Right. I think that's really important. Fast. Absolutely. <clears throat> I want to close wishing to address God as divine goddess. In some cultures, the divine goddess is Mother Earth, an Earth under attack. And in fact, some might say Mother Earth 
is, in a euphemistic sense, being sexually assaulted. We've spoken a lot about the divine goddess within. Might we close speaking to the divine goddess all around us, if necessary, proof of her existence? save Mother Earth, literally and figuratively? Beautiful. A very cause very dear to my heart. It's true that when the body of woman gets desacralized through patriarchal norms and values, then the body of Gaia, Gaia consciousness, your Mother Earth also gets desacralized by extension because, of course, Gaia is, 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 is an expression of the divine feminine, <laughs> you know, she's a goddess too. So how can we, uh, you know, uh, not connect with, 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 with this beautiful Gaia body if, if we're truly in spirit? And so what we witness right now again is how the, the unhealthy masculine or the hyper-masculine literally uh, ransacks this planet, exploits her resources, you know, at, at, to a degree that we have not witnessed before and which is truly heartbreaking and, you know, the whole species extinction and it's just on all levels. So unless we, we address that, you know, imbalance of the yin and yang, the masculine and feminine, we cannot bring ourselves in alignment with the earth, with, with the Gaia body. So unless we don't heal ourselves, you know, internally do the deep work, we cannot live in harmony with the earth and by the way indigenous traditions have been telling that for a long time that's why you know when they take something from the earth they always give back to the earth by by, by giving an offering or engaging in a sacred ritual to honor her so this is key again that disconnect that we witness this duality thinking also applies to the earth we see people being so disconnected from nature because you know we're living in a highly a technological society they've, they've lost the reverence for nature and, and we need to reclaim the sacredness of our beautiful planet you know which with, with which we you know share with, with other beautiful life forms and it, 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 it's totally tied into what we've, we've been discussing all along Ah, leave it to the goddess she shall save us all <laughs> I've been speaking with Isabella Price her book is Goddess Power, available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon.com, and at fine independent bookstores everywhere. For more information, visit Isabella's website at onetruth-manypaths.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to Talkish with Hallie Caster jane The Hallie Caster jane Show, a production of Resic LLC. Be sure to tune in to Talkish Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, when new podcasts are posted at HallieCasserJane.com. Until next time, this is Hallie Casser Jane. It's a wrap.